Hi, this is Dave Edwards, and I'm pleased to be joined in the uh, Zoom world by David Allen, a man who needs no introduction to any of us. Uh, good to see you, David. Thanks for joining me. Dave, thanks for inviting me. I am always glad to, you know, hang out with people in the in the universe that you've been in and are in, and GTD support supporters. You know, because a whole lot of my world is about how do we get this message, you know, to a planet so we have a world with no no problems, only projects. But that's a that's a big mission. So, and you know, someone like you and your background and your interests or whatever, you know, such a great champion of our stuff. Thanks. I'm well, delighted to chat there. Yeah. Well, you've done a wonderful job in, in, in spreading the good word, but in most of the interviews that I have seen you do, the people who interview you tend to want to talk about GTD, the methodology, and get into those things, but I want to go in a slightly different direction. One of my favorite expressions that you use is your brain is not for holding ideas, it's for having ideas. So I want to probe what's in your brain, you know, what's lurking in those dark corners of your brain, if you don't mind. <laughs> But but let's step backwards just a little bit. Do you ever reflect on the early days when you were working on putting GTD together? I mean, how did you do it? I did not wake up one morning with some grand epiphany about this whole thing. It's really a, a, the result of a long string of epiphanets, basically. But I got into it because when I started my own consulting practice, and I started my own little consulting gig, simply because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I just wound up being a good number two guy, I helped a bunch of friends start, you know, with their own businesses and just because I didn't know what else I wanted to do with my life, uh, you know, but it wasn't stupid and, and I wanted, you know, some interesting stuff. So I found I had people in my network who were starting their own businesses, had small gigs or whatever. And again, I became a good number two guy Then I'd walk in and help them do whatever they were doing. Uh, I'd look around and just say, how much easier can we do this so I can leave earlier and you can leave earlier and, you know, we get more done with kind of less efforts being the lazy guy I am. And, uh, you know, I helped them fix that. Now they call that process improvement, but I just said, look, how can we, and, and then of course I don't help them fix it and improve it. And then I get bored, I'd get onto cruise control and go, okay, what else is there to do? And then, and then I get bored and then go, I just go leave and get another gig. Then I discovered they pay people to do that. They call them something, you know, consultant, you know, couldn't spell it. Now I are one, <laughs> hung out my, sh hung out my shingle in 19, God, when was this? 1981, Allen Associates. I created my own little consulting practice, but because of my experience, you know, a lot of this day came from my attraction to clear space, you know, a, a whole lot of, before I got into all of that, you know, I sort of, I was in the self-exploration world, you know, come on, I was in American intellectual history in graduate school in Berkeley in 68. So, you know, uh, heady time to be there, but discovered that academia was not where I could find enlightenment. I, I got tired of studying people who had theirs, I wanted mine. So I dropped out of school and then just went on this deep dive of self-exploration, you know, mm -hmm. so spiritual practices, meditation, martial arts, all kinds of you know occult explorations and so forth in the, in the inner worlds and that that was my primary interest all the rest of it was just to have a job to pay the rent um so i wasn't particularly aspirational or entrepreneurial i was just more into just okay i gotta how do i how do i still you know manage and, and sustain a, a, at least a little bit of a lifestyle while i'm doing all this self-exploration stuff and then you know as i began to say okay well now I'm a consultant, I guess, but I was more interested in, to begin with. And how do I keep a clear space? Because because as I started to get into the professional world and have a professional world, my life got more complex. It got busier, you know. As anybody, as you know, when you graduate, it does get easier. You know, uh, the better you get, the better you better get. So as I as I started to step into the world of professionalism and 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 so forth, I saw, gee, it was pretty it was pretty easy to lose clear space. So I said, how do I get, how do I keep that for myself? And so I just wound up finding these techniques that allowed me to sort of surf on top of my world a lot better, get more control, get more stability, get more focus uh, while still being busier. And then I turned around, it turns out as I was discovering these techniques piece by piece, 
uh, turned around and started to use them with my clients, with my consulting clients, and it turned out that what I had discovered worked for them too, exactly the same way. When they started to implement these techniques, more control, more focus, more stability, more space, more room in their head to focus on the meaningful stuff, I said, wow, that's cool. So that became just part of what became part of the core of my consulting process. And I was very interested, by the way, in finding models then because, you know, you know, honestly, Dave, I've never had any traditional or formal education in business psychology or time management. You know, all my stuff came out of the street. They're just learning. But I guess that's maybe why what I uncovered was unique and nobody else seemed to have done it that way because I didn't have any preconception about what it needed to be, what this thing needed to be. Well, I'm thinking about that because I'm trying to put this into the timeline. I mean, now, I mean, I found GTD and you out of frustration for not being terribly productive. And, you know, you do a Google search and there's GTD and there's a lot of other people with a lot of advice. But it's probably fair to say that in the 1980s, there was a lot less for you to be able to read what other people were doing. So it was it mostly trial and error for you. Yeah, well, yeah, it was basically trial and trial and trial and trial. I, you know, I wasn't making a lot of mistakes with this because as I was discovering these techniques, instantly they work for me and instantly they work for anybody else. All you have to do is get somebody to write down stuff that's on their mind. They're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. Right. Like there's, so I apologize. There's a bit of a duh factor in what I uncovered. Right. It seems to have worked for a lot of people. So uh, yeah, it worked. And I had no idea. I mean, it was still, even back then, Dave, it was pretty noisy space in terms of time management and organization. Cause that was all, that was all sort of taking, you know, th there was a lot of heat in that area in the eighties. And that's when people discovered personal planners. That's where, you know, um, oh, just all kinds of models were showing up about personal organization and personal productivity. So, um, but again, mine was just how do I work with a client? How to work with myself? What are the best practices? And I had a couple of mentors that taught me some pretty key things. I, I got hungry for models because if I said, well, as a consultant, if I walked into somebody or somebody's situation, and it wasn't obvious what I needed to do or how I could improve their situation. It'd be nice to pull a model out of my pocket and say, let's just walk you through this because I know this model works. And I had some pretty sophisticated people, you know, coach me and, and teach me uh, on that. So I, uh, you know, I attribute Dean Atchison, not the famous one, but, you know, uh, a guy that I knew who'd been an executive coach and, and consultant for, for, you know, decades. And, uh, I discovered he had he had discovered a model that worked extremely well and was highly uh, effective for organizational change. And he had uncovered some techniques there. And it turned out I connected with Dean through my network and then he took to me and it became sort of a mentor of mine. And for a couple of years, I hung out with him and he and I did a lot of projects together. And he sort of handed off to me a lot of what he had learned. For instance, uh, the mind sweep, getting everything out of your mind and taking everything that you got out of your mind and making next action decisions about it and having some entrusted system, systematic way to then manage that externally you know, in terms of what you capture and then how do you communicate about it, what you decide about it and so forth and how do you distribute that. Because he had found that was absolutely critical for an organization uh, to make change, especially from the top down, if they are hung up with old business and open loops still spinning around in there, very difficult to create a new loop mm -hmm. or to move on it. So this worked for you. You took it into the marketplace with your, with your clients and, and it obviously took off. Uh, and, and did that ever surprise you that this, that this journey that you started for yourself turned into the, the, the huge enterprise that it became? I had no idea it was going to be a huge enterprise. As a matter of fact, I didn't know I was going to do anything other than have something that kept a pretty good job with my little small consulting practice. Then it turned out, I, you know, a senior guy and a, you know, the head of HR and a big corporation saw what I was doing and said, geez, but David, we need that in our whole company. Can you design something, you know, some sort of a training or a format so we can reach a lot of people with this model that you've uncovered here instead of just one-on-one? -on -one? So I said, sure. So I spent a couple of months and designed a personal productivity training using these techniques I'd uncovered. And it was hugely successful. A pilot program, you know, for a thousand executives and managers over a year that was quite successful, un unbelievably successful. That was Lockheed 1983-84 in Burbank. 
Mm. So that suddenly thrust me into the corporate training world with this stuff. It's like, wow, who'd have thought? You'd have told me as American intellectual history major in Berkeley in 68 that I'd be in the corporate training world. I go, you know, come on, what are you smoking? You know, like, give, me, give me a break. But it turned out that was the hungriest audience. And it turned out that what I'd uncovered and recognized and then been able to more objectify and formalize as a model turned out to be the, the thing that the, the most sophisticated people were the hungriest for. Because at that time, that was when the world was starting to experience email and a lot of the tsunami of things coming at them and and the rapidity of change that was going on in organizations at that time and that then thrust me into that corporate training world and then it was just who knew i, I had no idea dave it took me 25 years to figure out what i'd figured out and that it was unique and that nobody else had done it and that it was bulletproof yeah and this was all just in the street just doing something keeping a good job and just following my nose to and just picking up the phone. I never did any marketing about it. It was all referral based. And, and, and is, it, is it fair to say that uh, the system that we know today is pretty much the system that you designed back then? I mean, it doesn't seem to have gone through any major uh, renovations. And it won't. When we fly to Jupiter in 2090, they still need an in basket. They still need to decide the next actions of the stuff they capture. They're still going to need to have some external brain that they can organize results of what they figure out. They're going to still need some sort of review and reflection process on the content. So they make good trusted choices about how to get to Jupiter or get off of Jupiter. So, you know, I didn't make this up. I just recognize what we do, you know, in a situation that has potential ambiguity, more choices than is obvious, you know, in the moment. How do you get control of that? So, you know, as you know, the five steps that, that are sort of some of the core aspects of how do you get control and stability in a, in a context, you know, capturing, clarifying, organizing, reflecting, and engaging, those things, I didn't make them up. I just recognized those are the stages we go through. If you want to get your kitchen under control or your consciousness under control, it's all the same thing. It's just most people, most people don't do all of those because they don't have a, <laughs> they're not driven to get their consciousness under control. They're addicted to ambient anxiety that they're living in. Uh -huh. do, you, do you find it interesting when, when uh, practitioners of GTD, um, you know, almost apologize when they fall off of the system and they try to get back on it? I mean, how, I'm how, do, sure. how do you read that? It's just habit change and everybody goes, oh, God, you know, everybody should exercise more. Everybody should probably eat better. Everybody should spend more time with their kids. Every, you know, go, come on. You know, just welcome to the world of, oh, this is a best practice, but I wasn't born doing it. That means I actually have to change or refine or upgrade some behaviors, you know, that uh, are not on automatic. Mm -hmm. So you need to get them on automatic. It takes most people, Dave, from my experience, once they get this, even the best and brightest, I don't know, you can tell me how long it took you before... Uh, capturing everything that has their attention they can't finish in the moment gets written down mm -hmm. i don't Little know or big for me it was just a liberating thing i mean once i once that kind of like sunk into my brain it became so easy and, and yeah but how long did it take it how long did it take it to sink into your brain well it probably took me a good year before that was like really my habit but that's I, what I, i'm talking that, yeah. that's what you asked right <laughs> right I do remember, though, that one of the things that it, early in my GTD journey that I felt bad about, in fact, I was, I, I was telling somebody about this just recently, that um, I sort of saw the book as kind of like my, my Bible, my direction for the future. And as I read the book, you know, I implemented certain things, first, second, and third. I, I can't say that I implemented the whole thing all at once, and along the way, I kind of modified the steps to kind of suit my work. Uh, and I felt guilty about that initially, that like if I wasn't doing it the David Allen way, that somehow you were gonna reach out and you were gonna slap me silly. <laughs> yeah, but at some point you probably came back around and said, you know, what David said was really the right way to do it. <laughs> you know? Sorry. That's true. That's, that's, Hell, it is that's true. true. <laughs> now, some time ago, you, you uh, co-authored the book uh, GTD for, uh, for Teenagers, I believe it was called. Right. I've often wondered why 
productivity and organization isn't something that's taught in the schools. It, it would seem to me that it would just save a lot of people a lot of angst. Yeah, it's true. Well, come on. Uh, most people never even thought about being more productive or managing themselves until re relatively recently. I mean, you have to kind of hand it to Peter Drucker, the great late, you know, Peter Drucker to sort of convince the world that there were best practices that you're not not, not normally or naturally doing. You know, The Effective Executive is still a great book mm -hmm. you know, that, that Drucker wrote. And, and so, and the reason, by the way, time management became popular, you can't manage time. You don't mismanage five minutes to come up with four and a half or six. You know, time just is. They call it time management because people who are important um, don't want to be embarrassed by saying, I need to help in managing myself because of the money they're pay being paid. So they call it time management. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so important. I got it. I need to how to manage my time. So how, how about how do you manage yourself and your focus? Oh, duh. So you know, <laughs> you know, out of all that, it actually relatively, if you look at the sort of the history of work and the history of that, all the way back to you know Taylor and all those other people that began to think about productivity, is actually relatively recent that people even thought about the idea of how much more effective we could be. Now, Taylorism and what, you know, ultimately sort of the, the, the current version of that would be agile and scrum and, and lean and non bottom all those things about how do I most effectively manage the flow of work that's most effective and efficient. Mm -hmm. But as a good friend of mine who runs the Lean Institute, he said, David, GTD is lean for the brain. How do you make sure that you have no wasted thought, that your cognitive function is as clean and streamlined as it needs to be? And that's what I sort of, in spite of myself, uncovered was that only people who were sort of aware of that other process sort of began to recognize that what I'd come up with. Another good friend of mine, you know, very senior guy in one of the big consulting firms said, David, you, you discovered sort of uh, knowledge work athletics. <laughs> what, are the, what are the moves that you need to make to be able to then sustain yourself amidst this world where it's a lot more complex, a lot more choices, a lot more ambiguity? and a lot more volume and speed of change. And so I just kind of, I, I, know, I guess back to a previous question of yours, I had no idea that was what I was coming up with. I was just trying to keep a job and keep my head clear <laughs> and find, you know, and, and keep people interested in what I was doing and that, that it was valuable to them. And so that was a process as I, I'll, I'll say it again, it took 25 years to, to figure out that these things that I figured out and how to work them and best practices about them was uh, was unique that nobody else had done it. I thought I was the last guy in the world to figure this out. I thought people who were making a lot more money than I was had already figured this out. Eh, wrong answer. Turns out that those people needed this more than anybody. Yeah. Well, I think I would have been a lot more uh, successful uh, through my college years had I known some of these techniques back then. Uh, and I think Me too. You know, and I think that's the whole thing. I mean, it's like a, everybody discovers it at different stages in their lives. But I sort of think like if we made a conscious effort to even teach students how to study, much less be productive, it, it would save everybody a lot more, you know, angst as they get older. Yeah, it could be. But, I, you know, I'm not an expert in how to study. I'm not an expert in memory. I'm not an expert in a lot of things that would probably facilitate. I'm not even an expert in speed reading. I have a lot of friends that are you know, really good at all those different things. That's not my thing. But a student needs to understand what the outcome is, what the action steps they need to take, and have some good system that keeps them focused on what to study, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and when, and to be able to see the context of their world and all of their commitments, so that when they start to study, they can focus on it, as opposed to being distracted by a gazillion other things that are kind of out of control in their life. So my whole thing was more about a, a larger gestalt about how do I get control and focus about my world so that I can then be present with whatever I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's, that's really the, the big secret, you know, of getting things done. It's not as much about getting things done as it's about being appropriately engaged with your commitments so that you're, you're clear and you're focused and you're present with whatever you're doing. How successful are you now at uh, keeping, keeping clear space in your head? Uh, Hey, I'll, I'll show you mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here's a little, while we were walking our dog this afternoon, Rachel. Uh, 
Rachel has a puppy that our puppy loves to play with. And so Catherine, Catherine said, I need to, I need to connect in with Rachel and make sure we go out with our dogs at the same time so they get great exercise. I made a little note. So I will send Catherine, I'll ping her with them, I think. And then uh, some pictures that I took that I want to send to Catherine, this is my wife. So, you know, God, these are, these are not life critical things, but they were things that popped into my head that that prevents them from popping in twice. Yes. Not only that, those things will get done because that's going to get torn off and thrown into my physical entry. And that physical entry is going to get emptied within the next 24 hours. So those things are going to get into process, do whatever I want to do with them. So, but you got to remember, I'm, I'm fellow student. I'm fellow student. I, it's not like I figured this out and then implement it and don't have to do anything about it anymore. Or no, I just figured out what I've got to do. What I have to do is stay clear. You've got to remember to write down more than Rachel, because when you get to be uh, in my age, at least, I come back and I look at that and go, uh, Rachel, what did that mean? That's right. That's why I have to look at it pretty soon. <laughs> look, I'll be 75 next month. Maybe. So, you know, I, I understand. You know. <laughs> okay. So what is occupying your, uh, your, your clear space these days? What have you been thinking about? What, what have you been working on? Well, as you probably know a lot of what we've done as we've built our business, I'm still very interested in, in how do I, I, again, our mission of how do we create a world with no problems, only projects, and found out that I uncovered a key uh, that was able to be able to produce that kind of result at whatever level people wanted to engage with it, and it became globally attractive. And especially once I published Getting Things Done, I had no idea what, it, what the uptake was gonna be on it. Um, I just had high anticipation, but no expectation. And then suddenly it became an inter, a, a US bestseller and then got translated into a lot of languages, became an international bestseller. So I suddenly found myself thrust into the, 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 the world that wanted this in some way, but that was bigger gum than I knew how to chew. So I, I said, well, if I didn't want to keep this sort of this single little boutique, my own speaking and bestseller book kind of thing, which one could do, he said, okay, and my small little group of people and a small company that I had at that time of doing this work, we said, okay, shall we take this global? We said, okay, sure. But the only way we could do that would be technology and partnerships. And so we wound up, technology has been a long time coming to try to figure that one out in terms of how we do that. But the partnerships also, I didn't know how to do that. Uh, how do you create a global license process, you know, for training and, and intellectual property, you know? and so forth and a lot of coaching about that called careful you know um and so i didn't know how to do it but then long story short some people came to us who did know how to do that and so we wound up partnering with them you know david covey stephen's son you know who left franklin covey and they they he and his partner stephen mardix had 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 built an ip licensing company once they left franklin covey and sort of take advantage of their ability to know how to you know, they're the guys who built the seven habits around the world in terms of how to, how that got distributed. So they came to me because I was first on their list um, and we're still partnered with them. So they helped us, uh, you know, create a program to get this licensed around the world. So we still, and we still are doing this, you know, um, golly, seven, eight years later, we're, our, we, we're training master trainers and master and coaches, you know, uh, with our folks training them to be able to deliver this well. And then there was a business model set up to do that. So that's still a lot of what I'm doing is helping support our global network. We're officially represented in 90 countries now. So if you're that's around the world and you go, if you go to our website, just click on training and coaching and just type in your country, you'll see who, who's around there, who's a, a certified master trainer. And they're, they're doing, you know, public trainings and coaching, you know, with this methodology. But that, that was a, that's a short version of a very long story, Dave, but that, that this wound up being, I, I was again, still not particularly aspirational or entrepreneurial. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to keep this flame alive about what this is. And so then doing that as best I can to support our global network of people distributing this you know, as best I can. So we still have a very rich and, and elegant community of practice of master trainers around the world. We've got about 30 master trainers now. And they're just some of the coolest folks you'd ever meet. You know, they're the folks who we've, we've certified. They're now translating all this into their own languages, their own countries and regions. 
and getting this out there. And but a lot of that is still in very startup mode. So we're still so anything I can do to help support all of them. And I'm still doing two to three podcasts a week. Mm. I thought at some point everybody in the world who who would be interested in GTD would get it and then then it'd all <laughs> die out. No, you still keep coming out from under the rocks going, wow, who'd have thought, you know, that the world keeps awakening to this. And I keep being surprised, you know, as you're a, a GTD Connect member, I mean, I, I always keep being surprised by how many people I never met, you know, ran across this at some point in their life, what was critical for them. They became huge champions of this. I never met them, yeah. but they became, they became ambassadors of this stuff like you. Yeah, you know, and 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 so I keep responding to all of that. I've I've never gotten any request for you know maybe maybe two or three in the last twenty years or maybe ten that I that were sleazy you know people that just wanted to do whatever they wanted to do that this didn't seem right. But otherwise, I take advantage of every opportunity to share what this inf information, this methodology does because without it, without exception, it improves conditions. And it's not running with scissors. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing, you know, what are you going to hurt? Everybody says, oh my God, it's too, it's too structured. I go, what's too structured about writing stuff down that has your attention? By the way, what's too structured about deciding what you're going to do about it? What's too structured about you know, parking that some reminder in some place you trust? What's too structured about reviewing where you park that stuff so you don't miss something? Duh. Sorry, I, I, I warned you. I warned you there would be a duh factor here. But you know, most people when they're in their mid seventies, with with all due respect, are are slowing down. It sounds like that's far from what you're doing. I don't think I could. Well, yeah, slow down. I mean, you know, I've slowed. I've been able to leverage what I'm doing so that I don't have as much pressure, day to day, minute to minute, for all the details of what you know of what sort of created this business to begin with. But I still have, you know, there are now three p possible potential books, ideas in the works about this that haven't, that are not out there yet. So I'm still talking to my editor about those, you know, that's still there. And I don't know, I don't know what I, well, the paintings behind you are paintings I've done. You know, I'm, I picked up the flute again. I taught myself 30 years ago and then it kind of dropped off for a while. And then I sort of picked that up again. So. I got a bunch of stuff that I'm going to flunk retirement if I ever did anything that looked like retirement. But as long as I'm conscious, I couldn't help but share what this is with anybody. Join the so, club, brother. I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> you, you, you are the painter of those uh, pieces behind you? That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I picked up acrylics about a couple, two or three years ago and huh. decided to, to play with it. I've always enjoyed drawing and, and so forth and took some then ran across a, a, a great coach about uh, painting and drawing, a guy named uh, Brian Bowmeisler. Uh, if you're ever interested in that, Brian was the son of, he was the son of the woman who wrote uh, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. Uh, and Brian was fabulous. So Catherine and I both took classes from it. And it sort of opened me up to the freedom to, to, to be able to do stuff like that. So, well, you but, know what? You know, my, I have I have uh, I have two point I think it's a two point one year, uh, <laughs> you know, jack of all trades, hobby of all trades. I I give a two two and a half years whatever, and then I'm kind of like okay now now that now let, let me go do something else. So I so you know on a future uh, on a on a, on a future connect uh, uh, video we are expecting a flute recital. I just want to point that out to you. <laughs> Yay! Oh, I love the flute. I, and the reason I, I, I taught, I learned the flute, I played the piano when I was a little kid and I'd, I'd done experimenting with other kind of instruments, but at some point I was traveling a lot and I wanted to get back into music again. I said, what can you travel with that's easy to carry? And also what has a lot of good solo music? Mm. So uh, the flute seemed to be the, the, the right answer. So, you know. So Would it be fair to say that, that, that your move uh, from California to Amsterdam maybe opened up more time for some of these creative pursuits? Because back when you were in California, it seemed like you were the chief disciple, the chief trainer, the chief everything uh, with a small staff around you. But uh, now do you just have, has Amsterdam just opened a creative side of you? Not really. It, Amsterdam was there because I, the creative side was already open. And so, you know, our world, as our world was becoming more virtual anyway, 
And Catherine, my wife, said, you know, we need to get out of the U.S. because the U.S. just has such a U.S.-centric thing. We saw people slightly older than us looking more sedentary than we wanted to be. We don't have kids. We're still in good health. We said, okay, time to throw a dart and, you know, shake our world up and go somewhere else. It just turns out that, I, you know, I was doing all that in California as well as we were becoming more of that. So it wasn't this change was not really about changing a whole lot about what I was doing or how I was doing it. It was more like just changing my environment, which is always nice to kind of shake it up and, you know, kind of you know, shake all that stuff up anyway. But I, I was doing the same kinds of things in, in California. We, we moved simply to change the environment and also we wanted to get out of US centricity in terms of our thinking and the thinking around us and the culture. So, I like to ask people uh, like you who have left the states and are spending time overseas, um, what's it like back? And I don't, I don't want to get political, but what's it like uh, now looking back at the United States and everything that the, the the nation is going through? I mean, what's what are your thoughts when when you and Catherine get together? Do you talk about that? That would be a much longer conversation than whatever. Because again, Dave, I was an American intellectual history major in college. So I, my whole interest was the psychology or the psyche of the U.S. and the DNA of the thought process that was in, built into the U.S. thinking, which I absolutely loved and was thrilled with. I'd been an exchange student in high school, lived in Switzerland with a Swiss family and sort of learned what the Swiss culture was when I was 17 or 18. And when I came back, I said, wow, this is really different. And the U.S. has something quite unique. So I was enthralled with all that. So, I, you know, I, and there's a lot of things I could say about that. But that was why I, my choice for graduate school was American intellectual history, the history of thought, history of culture, you know, history of the history of the DNA, essentially, of what was America, which is incredibly incredible. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what was fascinating moving here was not leaving that discover it was discovering the source mm, so a whole a whole cool. lot of what what makes america cool started a few blocks from where i am right now yeah this is the seat of the enlightenment this is the first place in the world where the the individual took precedence over monarchy and church this is the first place in the world where a woman could come from the country side in the netherlands in the 1600s by herself and find a job and buy a piece of stock in the first stock exchange in the world mm. and you know i mean there's just so much about the dutch culture and so i got enthralled with the dutch culture itself so not that that was the reason for doing we just found this was kind of the perfect storm it was enough of a foreign country to be adventurous but everybody speaks english here so <laughs> you can you shouldn't get by and it was more the center of the world. I mean, come on, Amsterdam was much more the center of my world than Santa Barbara was in terms of getting around, especially as we began to build a global network of people. Sure. So this this became a great hub to be in. It could have been anywhere. I, we just wanted to be somewhere near a good airport and that we loved. It could have been Stockholm, could have been London, it could have been Milan, could have been Kyoto. No, Kyoto is too, too far away from everywhere else. But anyway, those are places we loved anyway. So once our world became virtual and we were able to then take this methodology into a virtual world more so, and then I was able to then sort of distribute the accountability and responsibility and, the, and a lot of the work you know, of, of, of coaching and training, especially once we found a good US uh, partner, Vital Smarts out of Provo. And they, were, they took to us, we took to them, and they were able to, we were able and felt comfortable enough to with DNA match with what we were doing that we were able to hand off to them, you know, all of our training in the US and Canada, which is a big part of what I was doing before. It's why we were able to go from 50 people down to five, simply because a lot of what I was doing before was just trying to maintain coaching and training, you know, in that part of our world as opposed to international. But now we're totally global. So we, we've actually become sort of more of an IP uh, licensing company than anything else. So a lot of my work is how do we support that? Mm -hmm. A lot of that is supporting startup, you know, people in these different countries that are doing this and, and helping validate them, helping giving them good PR and still creating, I'm still creating, you know, um, thought around this whole, you know, getting things done process and content. 
you know, I've just been, I just took on today, I just added to my action list, writing a, a new article about procrastination. Because there's some stuff I came up with years ago that we had to kind of drop out of our sort of simplifying the training. So we do people more got the basics, but there's some more sophisticated stuff about that. So I'm, so I still keep being pinged about that and keep being interested in doing that. Yeah. So, well, I right, think was that, I guess that, I guess that's the best answer I could give you right that's, now. Uh, I think that's what keeps you young. You know, you're, you, you keep your brain moving. Alzheimer prevention. <laughs> exactly. well, just, just try to learn Dutch. That's my big project. Because right <laughs> we, we actually intend to immigrate. Ah. So I actually want to give up my U.S. passport and get a Dutch one. Interesting. So Interesting. hopefully that'll be next year if we do that. Well, when I, uh, when I asked to do this interview with you, I mean, uh, like I said, I, I could spend hours with you talking about GTD and the methodology, but I actually... I really appreciate you letting us uh, get a little glimpse of, uh, of David Allen uh, outside of GTD and some of your thought processes. And uh, I, I hope we uh, get to have a conversation like this again. Anytime, Dave. All right. I'm, I'm all yours. This is fun. David, sure. thanks very much for joining us.